Hi, this is John Groders, and you've tuned into the No Shame Podcast, where we hold discussions at the intersection of faith and culture. Today's guest is screenwriter and producer Brian Bird, who is simply as good as it gets in this genre, so join us. Welcome to the No Shame Podcast. I'm John Groders, and our guest today is Brian Bird. And uh, Brian is a, a screenwriter, an author, a producer, and uh, frankly, one of my favorites in the business. And I got to admit, right off the start here, I'm really, I'm really kind of pleased to be, uh, to be talking with you today, Brian, because I've been such a fan of your work, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. I, I'm honored to be on with you today. We've been at a couple of conferences together in the last year or so, and I've heard you speak at the NRB, uh, and I heard you speak at the ICVM. These are just acronyms that mean nothing to people, but they're big conferences <laughs> where people get together to talk about what this podcast is about in a way, which is the intersection of, of faith and culture. And right. I want to say this morning, I came into the office early, and I put on The Case for Christ. And I watched it this morning, so it's fresh in my mind. And, and wow. Brian, you've done a lot of projects, uh, movies, television shows. Uh, those of you that don't know, Brian was a, a pr- executive producer and writer on Touched by an Angel, um, very popular series, One Calls the Heart. He's got a new book out, When, when God Calls the Heart to Love. And uh, we'll talk about those things. But the thing I want to talk about is the movie, The Case for Christ. And this is going to be one long commercial for it. If you haven't seen The Case for Christ, at the end of this conversation, you were going to want to watch it. Now, you um, you were the writer on this film, and I'm interested in this film because my film last summer took second place to The Case for Christ, which won first place, and I hadn't seen it, but I've heard so many good things until this morning. What a film. What a book. I read Lee's book 25 years ago like everybody and uh, loved it, thought it was a fantastic, maybe the best apologetic book since mere Christianity for, for me personally. Mm. But you've mm-hmm. turned it into a film, and my goodness, what an achievement. Let's dive in. you remember how you got involved and, and, and what brought you into this idea of making this into a cinematic feature? Well, you know, I, I had met Lee uh, way back when he was um, uh, on staff at Saddleback Church. You know, so he was... He sort of came of age as a as an apologist uh, at Willow Creek uh, Church uh, years and years ago, and then he joined the the speaking staff, uh, teaching staff of Saddleback Church, Rick Warren's church, which is where I you know attended for twenty years. And so I got to know Lee back back during the day, and I had heard his story and obviously read the Case for Christ, uh, but I also you know had heard his personal story. Uh, he and Leslie's personal story. And I always remember thinking, uh, wow, this, you know, this, this could make a good movie. Well, you know, nothing really came of that fantasy at that point <laughs> years ago. Um, but uh, I, he moved on to, uh, he left Saddleback and then moved to Colorado and then, uh, uh, and then on to Houston uh, where he lives now. And um, I, I actually moved to Colorado after he left Colorado, but he was coming back here to speak. And I hadn't seen him in, you know, maybe four or five years. And so I just wanted to go, you know, I just wanted to go sit in the audience and hear my friend speak because I just love, you know, his teaching and uh, his apologetics. And I never thought I would, you know, get to talk to him because it was at a, at a big church here in Colorado. And so I I left the, the service after he spoke and, was wandering out there, and I saw that he was all alone <laughs> over hmm. in a corner, you know, sort of waiting, you know, waiting to see if anybody wanted to come talk to him. So I made a beeline to him, and we had a, a little bit of a reunion, and uh, it was lovely uh, to see him. And he said, um, Brian, you know, there are uh, some studios pursuing the film rights to the case for Christ. Would you want to be involved? And I at that point, I said, gee, you know, saluted and said, how, how high do you want me to jump, mm-hmm, sir? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, would love, I would love that gig. Um, 
and lo and behold, it was Pure Flix that was the studio that was able to uh, secure the rights to Lee's story and the book. And I had been talking to Pure Flix about another project, and it was just sort of a perfect marriage. And so I came aboard as a writer and a co-producer on the movie. And uh, that's how, you know, that's hmm. how I got involved. But had I not, I'm not sure, you know, would have all, all, the, all the dots would have been connected had I not, you know, gone to hear him speak. So <laughs> good, good, uh, a good lesson for all of us, you know, listen to the still small voice when you get a prompting. Hmm. The moral <laughs> of the story is go to church. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Exactly. You know, it's it's so important that this project, I believe, fell into your hands because it's a big step between the book, The Case for Christ, and a screenplay. And, you know, when you take a, a novel or in this case, I don't know what you would call A Case for Christ, I guess a trade book, uh, the job of the screenwriter is invisible to many people, not invisible to the rest of us writers and you had to take a book with a lot of information, a lot of interviews, and you turned it into a drama. How, how did you do that? Well, I, I knew that, look, look, The Case for Christ is a beautifully written, you know, fiction, uh, nonfiction book uh, where Lee, you know, uh, talked to 13 of the world's foremost experts about the evidence for Christianity, historically. Uh, and it's not a movie. <laughs> right. 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 And so I knew that from the get go that, that that was not a movie. It would make a good documentary or a good mm-hmm. documentary series on, mm-hmm. on, on PBS, but it, it was not a movie. And so what I, you know, what I knew that I needed to do was to go back and dig out the personal story uh, for Lee and Leslie, because the reason Lee was able to write the case for Christ is that like C.S. Lewis uh, decades before him, he went on a journey to try to disprove Christianity, to try to debunk Christianity. That's where all the evidence came from. It was that, that search and that journey. And the reason why he wanted to debunk Christianity back in the day was that he was a hardcore atheist living a happy atheist, narcissistic life in this world, and he and his wife were just living a happy atheist life, and then Leslie, his wife, blew up his marriage by, you know, you know what was she thinking, going and becoming a Christian? She changed, uh, and he didn't want her to. <laughs> right, she became a Christian and kind of blew up his life, and he, so his first reason to try to to dig into Christian, the, the evidence for Christianity was in order to debunk it so that he could get his wife out of, out of the Willow Creek cult hmm. in his mind. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. was, she had, you know, bought a big con job. So I knew that to, in order to turn the case for Christ into a movie, I had to make that relationship between he and Leslie and that sort of hero's quest of the hero trying to save the damsel, you know, uh, from herself, I knew I had to make that the central storyline. And, you know, I found a handful of other sort of great sort of dramatic through lines that I was able to, you know, to include in the story. Because if it was just a a data dump, you know, it's not a movie. Oh, yeah. And and so, you know, weaving weaving the, the case for Christ around a big hero's quest is what we knew we had to do, and that love story was the central, you know, the central core. Well, the themes are outstanding. It is a husband and wife love story. It is a crime investigation story. It is a father and son story. It is a pursuit for right. truth story. It's, it's these big themes. But in, this, in the same time, you created uh, characters that I thought had fantastic depth. And, you know, right off the bat, you've got to find ways to introduce uh, these characters. And by the way, uh, Mike Vogel uh, does a fantastic job, I think, as the lead yeah. in this and is just fantastic. Yeah. Um, kudos to the casting Absolutely. directors and Mark Van Conan. But right off the bat, you have a scene where um, he's, a, he's being awarded something at the newspaper. And he says right away in this opening scene, thank you for the award and the promotion, mostly the promotion. Right away, we're getting to know him a little bit, aren't we? What are you setting up for us and who this character is? Well, 
You know, I, I came of age as a journalist myself, and I was actually a journalist sort of at the same time Lee was a journalist, but he was a much bigger deal than me. He, he you, were was, the, you were the San the, Gabriel Tribune, is that right? That's exactly right. I went to journalism school, and I was working for, you know, a medium-sized daily in Southern California as a reporter. Mm. And But he was the legal affairs editor at the Chicago Tribune, one of the most respected papers in the country. And I wanted to I wanted to start the movie with him, you know, really in his prime. And he was nominated for Pulitzer Prize mm. for for that same story that he got that award for. Mm-hmm. He didn't win the Pulitzer, but he was nominated for a Pulitzer. The Pinto for investigation that same story. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the Pinto investigation. He was the guy that blew that story up. Wow. <laughs> so uh, to speak. <laughs> investigated Yeah, exactly. And um so anyway, I wanted to I wanted to start him off at, at in a great place, right? In a place where we we understand that he's he's the man, right? And that he he is a man who has sort of established a, a bit of an empire for himself right. in, in his a, atheistic you know glee, and um, you know that you I always feel like you need to start your hero out sort of in in either transition or at the pinnacle of success because you're about to undress him mm, mm-hmm, <laughs> when you send mm-hmm. when you send him on the journey mm. right into the story and so <laughs> you know in, in Lee's case this was not you know there was no dramatic license with that regard in that regard because he he ap- that absolutely was the case with him the hmm. year that Leslie became a Christian was the year that he was Mr. Big Shot at the hmm. at the Caribbean. He he also says in that in that very very early scene to uh, to the character played by Brett Rice, uh, he says, "And you've been like a father to me. You're planting something right there, right off the bat, too, aren't you?" Well, I am. Yeah, you're. You know, Act One. You know, as you know, is all about setting up the rest of the movie. You know, and helping the audience fall in love with you know, the characters. And because if they don't fall in love with the characters, they're not going to want to go on the rest of the journey <laughs> with you. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, one of the, you know, as I mentioned, there were like these four sort of pillar storylines. One was the case for Christ. <laughs> uh, one was the love story. One was the criminal investigation that was sort of paralleling. It was the, his day job while he was trying to debunk Christianity. And then one was the father son theme. <laughs> and, one of the things that Lee came to discover on his journey was that um, all of the, you know, if you go back and retrace the childhood, the childhoods of the pinnacle atheists of the last couple centuries, all the great ones, the, the big ones, they all had estranged, you know, relationships with their fathers. Either their fathers died when they were young mm-hmm. or they were abusive mm-hmm. or, uh, or, or there was abandonment issues. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, in Lee's case, he was estranged from his father mm. for years and years and years. And, you know, th- the idea behind that is that how can you even imagine a heavenly father if you can't, if you want to have mm. nothing to do mm. with your own father on this plane? And so uh, the fact that so many other, like, of the world's most famous atheists had daddy issues hmm. uh, was n- was not a surprise in hindsight to Lee, hmm. uh, and so we wanted to we wanted to highlight that as part of the storytelling. Oh, and you mentioned Nietzsche and Sartre and uh, Hume exactly. and uh, Darwin. Yeah, um, the atheist journey. You know, I I thought one of the more painful scenes that that hit me emotionally that I've that I've seen in a long time, and I thought it was brilliant the way you did this because you want us to know where your character's at, but but it's kind of hard to somehow communicate to your film audience a person's beliefs. But he's tucking his daughter into bed uh, the night after she's been kind of uh, saved from choking, and he he is cuts off his wife who's who's trying to explain to her <clears throat> who Jesus is because she heard the name of Jesus in the restaurant and he cuts her off and he says to his young daughter honey we're atheists we believe in what we can see and touch you, you found a way to put that i don't know how did, what did you when when did that line come to oh. you do you remember that yeah absolutely <clears throat> the the thing is is that 
Lee loved his family deeply. You know, atheists are not ogres. They're people. <laughs> they're actually children of God who don't know it yet, right? Made in his image. And, I, you know, every, you know, that's one of the, the pitfalls of Christian filmmaking is that the, the unbelievers usually are painted with horns on, on their heads, exactly. you know? And right. I, I, I didn't. I didn't believe that at all. This is an atheist who's, who loves his family, who's trying to save his family, right, from, from themselves. And um, so I wanted to establish this very interesting, loving dichotomy where he's passionate about his little girl, but he wants her to understand that, you know, it's possible to not believe in God and still have a happy life, mm. Right. Because mm. atheists do believe that, mm-hmm. right? Oh, of course. You, you, you know, Christians tend to look at atheists and say, oh, your life must be so miserable. Wrong. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> right. Many of them are, are incredibly happy people because they, they do believe they have the world figured out, right? Yes. And they know that in order to survive the, this, the world with all of its challenges and, 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 and speed bumps and, and traffic collisions, that you have to make the best of things. Because it would it would be a miserable existence if you just lived in sort of this existential crisis all the time, hmm. and so anyway, I, I really wanted to establish from the get go that this was a man who was deeply you know cared about his family. Uh, who who doesn't care about his fa- their family? You know what father? You know uh, I, I'm sure there are some that are just so completely narcissistic but you know i believe that most parents do care about their kids no matter what they believe you know not Uh, only did you paint him decent and and he is decent but i found that you painted a number of these characters who who bring their their atheism into the film you you also painted them intelligent and witty there there was a scene where he was discussing with with his his friend uh, ray his sort of father figure yeah. and ray recommends the bertrand russell book why i'm not a christian and they're they're talking about supporting each other to defeat this crazy uh, you know thing that his wife has gone through right. and as he's walking out the door brett rice says sarcastically i'll be praying for you well, and he says that's not right. even funny <laughs> now that's a great piece of writing it's fun to, you know, it's fun when you sort of build characters and grow characters to, you know, find the moments of levity, if you can. Uh, yeah, it's serious stuff that they're dealing with and talking about, but um, people, that's just, that's just life, right? That's just real life, you know, trying to, trying to create, you know, three-dimensional characters is what I've always believed in when you're when you're building a storyline and um, that means that they have a psychology, they have a sociology, they have a physiology, and they also have their, they're really 40 characters. They have a spirituality too, whether they want to recognize it or not. Mm. And all of those, all of those, uh, you know, systems in the bone structure of a, of a human being all interact with each other. Um, so, when characters start to come alive for a writer, you know, you're building a, a, a film, uh, you know, the characters have to come alive and they actually have to start writing their own dialogue. And sometimes those little moments are because the characters tell you what they want to say <laughs> as you're, as you're working this out. So, mm. yeah, but, it, uh, good, good catch. It's the opposite. I mean, I think in, in the perspective of a writer, you might, typically find the that you would have that you would have taken the perspective of the Christian who sees her or his partner as the one needing to change and we'd sort of go along on that journey but interestingly in this case you are we're closer with Lee Strobel's character who he himself is worried about his wife who has changed and there's conflict right. in this relationship deep sincere conflict one one scene he says you know, I'm going to file a missing persons report. And she says, that's not funny. And he says, it's not meant to be. I mean, that is just right. caustic. Right, right. Yeah, you know, the the um, the key to me uh, in this story was to make sure that it was, it felt honest. And, you know, every, every, everybody, even the villain in a story, and, I, and Lee's not the villain, he's actually the hero in the story. Even the villain in, in, in any story has a piece of the truth. 
right? Every character has a piece of the truth. They may not have it all, but they have a piece of the truth. And so Lee's truth is deeply relatable. You know, if it was the other way around, if we were telling the story from Leslie's perspective, you know, right. her she changed and found hope and life and faith. Lee, Lee was alone in his misery, and, and that was deeply painful to her. And, right, so, but from Lee's perspective, she really, she really did, it was her fault <laughs> that, that right. they were having the conflict, right? right. Not his fault. Mm. Uh, she was the one who went and changed, not him. Mm. So, uh, uh, you know, you, when, you, when you're writing a, a film about, you know, what you hope are real, authentic characters, you have to get into their shoes and walk in their shoes. Hmm. Uh, it, it, you, I've always believed that everybody has a piece of the truth, and you need to reveal their truth in a story, no, no matter who they are. And um, that actually should be the way we as Christians treat everybody in our lives. We need to honor the truth that people do have and, and, and praise that and... and uh, uh, you know, celebrate that because uh, just because we, you know, we may have connected with our 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 Creator in a in a you know a powerful relationship where we acknowledge our sin, but also receive, believe, and receive our you know our the, this Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, that that doesn't mean that you know those people don't you know, don't have value. God, God loves them as much as he loves us. And by the way, we just found some food, right? I love that old, that old saying, you know, we're just beggars who found some food. Uh, we're trying to tell those other people where we found food, but we're still beggars. We're still, you know, we're, we've, we've crossed the line, but we're just right on the other side of the line. We're not in, you know, we're not miles away from them. We're just on the other side of that line. So yeah. we're very close to them. We can reach across and hold their hand. Yeah. So that's why I feel like we need to honor, you know, uh, honor characters who may not, who, who may not be integrated, mm. uh, fully integrated. And um, uh, we need to treat people in our lives that way, too. You know, and Erica Christensen, who plays uh, Lee's wife, Leslie Strobel, in the film, uh, you know, she managed to take the, the words and the script and, and do that. She manages to um, both have a conflict with her husband while holding a loving spirit. And, and she, I thought, hit that mark perfectly where she is strong and yet she doesn't try to argue him into submission. Uh, there's a relationship that's going through some turmoil, but she handles her newfound faith in this film um, from a performance standpoint, in a very believable way. Yes. Yeah. I, I just, I, we are, I was so thrilled with our choices in our leads. Yeah. Uh, they were just, they so embraced these characters and, and uh, made them come to life in such a beautiful way. We're speaking with Brian Bird. This is the No Shame Podcast. Brian is a producer and a author and a screenwriter for, with 30 years of experience and has had his fingers in many, many great projects. Today we're talking about the film, The Case for Christ, which was uh, released in 2017. And if you haven't seen it, go on Netflix and see it and, and watch it with somebody. It's as good a film as you're going to find. Now, here was the challenge that I thought you, you had to wrestle with. There's all this data. It almost felt like an industrial, like when I do industrial films for companies and they want their right. features and benefits to be listed and you got, you've got sort of a conflict. So you had to get in resurrection theology and eyewitnesses and ancient sources and the extant copies and the swoon theory and Roman scourging and asphyxiation and blood and water and the shroud. You had all this data and yet you had to be afraid, almost deathly afraid, from turning this movie into a big lecture. Um, yeah. Um, how did you do that? It's true. It, very true. And, and you know, the, what, the, the, um, the archetype that came to mind for me as I was trying to figure this out was, to be honest, the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Dan Brown. <laughs> right, right. Uh, this this search that Robert Langdon is on to find the truth, 
and mm. the Vinci Code was, you know, was there was lots of uh, Doctor Explano information in that movie, but it was handled on the fly. It was handled in almost with a sense of desperation uh, and dramatic tension. That uh, I see. I thought, okay, well, if we can find a way to put. Lee Strobel on sort of a uh, of a Dan Brown, mm. Robert Langdon journey uh, to to you know because he's he's desperate to get his wife back right so that's the ticking clock for him and when she gets baptized it's all over for him right mm-hmm. he he he's trying to win her back to herself to what he thinks you know is away from the cult. And so it's a race against time for him to find the truth and to find out, you know, find that that smoking gun that will completely undermine, you know, her faith and and disprove what she has has believed and and then hopefully win her back over. So that's honestly that was the archetype I used. I said, how do we how do we make this exciting? Well, you get them on planes, trains, and automobiles. Mm-hmm, essentially, mm-hmm. he's got to go to meet with people. He's got to talk with people on the fly. Um, he's got, he, he's got, and, and there, uh, there always needs to be sort of a mysterious clue that, that sort of shows up, you know, uh, a, a big piece of evidence that, that sort of stuns him and stuns the audience in each of those, those sort of, um, uh, research moments that he goes on in mm-hmm. You know, when he goes to talk to the Catholic priest about the the uh, historical record of biblical documents, mm-hmm. there, there, nobody, re- you know, very few people understand how how many copies of the New Testament are in existence, as opposed to, uh, you know, of the original New Testament, original uh, uh, documents from the New Testament are in existence, as opposed to, say, other things that we believe are historically true and accurate, right? Ancient writings and, and documents, the Iliad, you know, Homer's Iliad. There are, there are, you, you know, there's one percent copies of the Iliad compared to, you know, the the existence of these other documents. So that's a really interesting, big sort of uh, contrast when you're when you're, you know, and most people don't really know that you just sort of take it for granted that there's credible evidence for your faith but when you kind of hear the that information it becomes amazing and if you and you get that information from somebody who dug in the dirt himself back in the day somebody who was a art sort of an indiana jones kind of character you know then it it makes it come alive more and you know, but the but the big sort of coda on on that scene when he goes to talk about the ancient documents, um, is when he sees that reproduction of the the Shroud of Turin mm-hmm. in in the in that in that cathedral. You know, he he's looking into the eyes of what could be the eyes of Christ there, and he's saying, "Well, what would make him do this? You know, what would make him go through that torture?" Uh, uh, you know, uh, and and the priest says, uh, "I don't know, love." Mm-hmm. It's and it's such a it's such a powerful resonance mm. because the movie is about Leslie trying to love him to Christ, love him into a relationship with Christ, not prove him into a relationship with Christ. And that's also what the love of the cross symbolizes. So. You know that felt like really powerful, uh, a really powerful uh, tie for for me uh, it, to, and and Lee did have an encounter with the the Shroud of Turin personally on his on his journey. So um, he he was deeply moved by looking into those eyes as he was sort of trying to figure you know sort all this out for himself mm. and. Um, so I just said, well, that is such a visual. Yeah. We have to do that. You know, we have to include that somehow. 
you know, the power of love is the compulsion, but the, 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 the power of reason can set up roadblocks. And so if, if you hadn't knocked down the roadblocks, if Lee hadn't knocked them down one by one in his book, it would have been an emotional journey or even a, a spiritual journey. But, but Lee brings that investigative reporter attitude to this thing, and you had to bring that into your film too, and you knock them down right. one by one. Maybe Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. You know, it dies in theory, but, you know, the soldiers weren't doctors. And they said, right. well, yeah, they weren't doctors. They were professional killers. And if a prisoner had escaped, right. they would be executed. I mean, you did right. give us data after data point after data point that just sort of destroys a lot of these premier arguments that I think people have found a way to just sort of dismiss the whole resurrection story. You had to address them, and you you right. did. But then right. you have a question. You, you ask the question. You're, you're in the movie, and I think it might have been a question you were asking yourself as a writer – uh, he says, when is enough evidence enough evidence? <laughs> Did you have right. that problem writing the screenplay? Uh, well, uh, it, Lee, Lee actually, that, that's, a, that's a line right out of the book that Lee sort of came to. Um, you know, he, he came to, 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 to a conversation where somebody challenged him like that. And I, mm. had, I had his, Kenny, his, his Christian colleague at the Tribune, sort of be be the become the voice of that and you know uh uh i i I was asking that but partly that was just me saying well is this going to be enough to actually live up to the title of the movie Mm. because um you know it was a real balancing act for us you know knowing it's called the case for christ so we have to make the case right but the book has 13 experts. We, we ended up with five in the movie. Right. So, right. right, there were eight more experts that we just ignored uh, and, <laughs> because, you know, we couldn't include everybody. Mm. And um, so, you know, the balancing act for me was, is, is, this, enough? <laughs> is this enough to make our case here? And, uh, you know, I think, you know, most people uh, would say, even if it's not, uh, they can go to the book now and do a deeper dive than than the movie was able to you know to take them through. It was a lot of good choices, in my opinion. A lot of great choices as a writer. Uh, what John Gunn's direction was like, um, because this all worked. And and I was actually interestingly uh, sent to Lee Strobel's house back in the '90s to by Zondervan to consider doing a, a, doc, a, a curriculum series on the book, and it and it ended up going oh, another direction. But I hadn't yeah. explored this book myself years ago, and and yeah. uh, even as a as we might have explored uh, that as a curriculum, I remember thinking the same thing: Are we going to do all thirteen? A lot of the stuff in the book is him sitting across a desk from somebody, but. You, you brought it to life, your words come on the page, and then you keyed in on another thing you had to pick <laughs> was what part of the scriptures are going to be transcendent in this film. And you kept coming back right. to this Ezekiel 36 passage, I'll give you a new heart, I'll put a new spirit right. in you, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What does right. that mean? Right. Well, this was a central verse to Leslie in her her sojourn with Lee, as Lee was trying to sort of debunk her faith, you know, she kept holding on to that. And there's a, so Lee and Leslie wrote a book together about, um, it's called A a Spiritual Mismatch in Marriage. (laughs) And it was, it was a book for couples like them, Mm. you know, where one of the spouses is a believer and the other is not. And how does the, the believing spouse survive that? How, what, do, what do they do? So I was able to draw from, from Leslie some of the deep spiritual truths that she kind of came to. And, is, and, and she had a couple of mentors in her life, one of which, you know, was we depicted in the film, Alfie. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she had some mentors who were very wise and had, you know, had been... Christians for a number of years, and so they had some great wisdom to share with her and to encourage her. And I wanted to make sure we could at least touch on her perspective on the whole thing as, as much as we, you know, could fit into the story, um, hmm. because that's because she loved Lee too, right? And hmm. 
And in their, in that crucial conversation after they have this nice date where he's sort of trying to court her and, you know, say he misses her and misses their life together, you know, prior to her becoming a Christian. And then it ends in this horrible, you know, scene in the car where he just devastates her by saying, you know, if the, if we're ha- if we're back to having the same conversation, you know, in five years, in in a year, I don't want to be there for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's basically saying to her, "Pick, you know, we're pick right. Mm-hmm. Our our marriage, as we know it, is over. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was deeply devastating to her. Mm-hmm. And you know, we needed to to we needed to take it to the limit as much as you can, sort of in a faith based movie, mm-hmm. uh, to make it authentic and, and feel honest. You know, I remember um, you saying. You mentioned this at one of the times I heard you speak last year, that when you started this project, didn't you go hang out in the basement with Lee and Leslie for a few days and, and just kind of get these stories from them? Yeah, I did, yeah, because I wanted to probe. I wanted to dig a little bit. I wanted to dig out the, 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 both the, the pain and the, and the joy of the love story that they had. And, um, and, I, I, and I wanted to find a catalyst for Leslie's change because, you know, in the real world, you, you know, things happen over time. Sometimes things don't happen like it's not as cause and effect as they might need to be in a movie. Right. And so Leslie's, you know, embracing of Christian, you know, of the Christian faith didn't necessarily happen after a catalytic moment, but in a movie, you need an inciting incident. And Mm -hmm. so that's where we used, you know, little Allison's choking scene mm-hmm. to to really get her questioning. You know, our life could have changed in a, in a heartbeat here. And uh, wh- what is it? What does it all mean if if that happens? And so that sort of sets her on her own existential journey at that point, and is what leads her to need something more than their happy atheism is giving her. Mm. We're talking with Brian Bird, um, screenwriter and author and producer, and we're talking about The Case for Christ, one of his projects, one of my favorites of his projects. It was also set in the 70s, which was a lot of fun for me. Just, just, uh, And I don't know if you wrote these things into the film, but I, I really had a, a smile on my face when I saw the Tootsie Pop commercial. Um, yeah. How many licks uh, when he had to pull the top off of the beer. I loved the brown corkboard <laughs> pen holder. I remember that. <laughs> and when they walked in the church, uh, a Keith Green song was being played. You put this love in my heart. I'm old enough to remember those times. Did did you write any of those little details, or did that come from the art department? So yeah, yes and no. So so some of them, you know, I layered in because that was my <laughs> time too. I mean, yeah. I was a journalist at the same time as Lee, and so I remember some of those moments, like when the printer is going downstairs at the newspaper that the desks would rumble <laughs> yes. right, in, right inside the newsroom right. and the and just the computer technology people tried to you know his editor putting the computer over in the corner because he was just sick of trying to you know trying to work this thing out i mean we all sort of came of age you know as the as technology was changing and uh, and I loved Keith Green growing up, so mm-hmm. I just said, if we're going to do, you know, if we're going to do a, um, you know, a, a sort of depict how church was changing back then, yeah, and how church was different, you know, like how Willow Creek met in a movie theater back yeah. in the day, you know, I just thought, okay, well, we got to use, you know, some of the archetypal worship music mm. uh, from from the time period. Mm. But all that being aside, we had a great art art department uh, and production design department that that helped us sort of make the world feel mm. real. That's hard to do, actually. Oh my um, goodness! Yeah, because one one had, thing can uh, throw it to pieces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, bad sort of a, a bad prop or something that doesn't look right, yep. you know, uh, can can really break the break the world. But the um, we, we had the good fortune. We shot it in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area, and we had the good fortune of being able to, strangely enough, use a lot of the props from Stranger Things. Oh, good. 
So after the first year, after the first season of Stranger Things, which was also shot in the Atlanta area, um, we were a, we had the you know good fortune to be able to rent a lot of the same props that they use in that show uh, to to try because that show is set in very much the same time period. Well, so, that's brilliant that cool. because you know in our world we have to work within budgets and. Uh, the budget right. for this could have been 10 times what it was. It did not suffer that it wasn't 10 times that it was, but you needed things like that to make it to make it real. You know, and the good writing, the Keith Green song was, was the You Put This Love in My Heart, which connects with your Ezekiel 36, your heart of stone. And that's, that's right. what the movie's about. It's about the softening of a heart. And it's not just evidence. In fact, she says at the end, he says to her, the, the evidence for your faith is more overwhelming than I could have ever imagined, but it wasn't just the evidence it was you. You never stopped loving me. That's what softens right. his heart. Right. And she's persistent. Yeah, she prays. Day, yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, I do believe that, you know, as Scripture says, we need to love the Lord, you know, with all our heart, mind, and soul. So, the, you know, yes, the mind is important, but the emotion and the heart and the love is just as just as crucial when when uh, we're doing a story like this and so yes i i love i love that speech i think that you know was a lovely um sort of conclusion to their relationship hmm. and an admission on the part of lee um but you know the 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 thing that you know i'm so proud of this movie in it, in it uh and so honored to have you know, played a part, you know, in, in helping to bring it to, to the world. But the thing that uh, is, is so moving to me is to know that it's on Netflix right now. Right. Right. And, and it's being taken around the world that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, uh, when I, the first thing I ever did was in 1984 was an episode of fantasy Island. And uh, you know, uh, I was 25 years old and I had my, I had my first cup of coffee in the big leagues mm-hmm. at a young age. And, uh, and then my opportunity there dried up. So I had one episode and then sort of the opportunity dried up and the show got canceled after that. And so I just continued to do my journalism for four years uh, until in, I was in Ethiopia doing a, a magazine piece for World Vision about the famine, the great famine there mm-hmm. uh, in, in the 80s. And I was watching television in a Hilton Hotel in Addis Ababa. And guess what I see? Not just Fantasy Island. <laughs> your episode. episode of Fantasy Island, <laughs> Did right? you write The Plane, The and Plane? It, was that your line? <laughs> no, no. No, that came way before me. Oh. Uh, but but my, my, I it was a crystal moment for me because it was mm. being, it was, mm. there was M. Herrick subtitles in it. And, you know, in the four years since I had done it, I had gotten a little perspective. You know, I, I felt like I was Mr. Big Shot, you know, four years earlier when I had my first big, you know, credit on mm-hmm. national television. But then that sort of, I got perspective on it in the next four years because that, you know, that was just one opportunity. And, I realized that if something as, and that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, who cares, honestly? Uh, but I, when I saw that being exported all over the world, it was a crystal moment be, for me because if something sort of that trivial is being cast around the world, then I, I, I realized that the opposite had to be true. You know, the, the opportunity for life and faith and inspiring entertainment was also there the potential of having that exported all over the world. And, um, I, I had a, an epiphany, you know, theophany at at that time Mm. just said, God, if you want me back in that game, do you want me to have access to writing, you know, for film and television that could go around the world, open the door. And a year later, I was on the staff of, you know, the writing staff of my first television show in 1989. And 10 years later, I was on the the writing staff of Touched by an Angel, 
And Touched by an Angel was being broadcast in 85 countries around the world at that time. And 30 years later, (laughs) The Case for Christ is on Netflix. So around the world. So, you know, for me, it was sort of one of those memorial stones moments. Uh, You know, when you have those epiphanies in life and you hear sort of a calling like that, uh, I you know, feel honored that God would sort of open my eyes like that at that, at that point. But you better listen to those things because they, they're life changers and you don't know where that's all going to go, but you just say yes and go on the journey and, and, and then let God surprise you with everything else. You know, James says, be careful those that want to be teachers, because if you lead the little ones astray, it's better, you know, a teacher who is a writer or a producer doesn't just have a classroom in front of them. They have potentially 85 countries in front of them. And you have handled this responsibility uh, beautifully, Brian, and nobly and with great sense of honesty and truth and also great art. I believe you've managed to maintain a family and a marriage through a, through a, a career that sometimes destroys them. And you have produced something now that I think, you know, I just, like I said at the beginning, this is going to be a big commercial. If you haven't watched The Case for Christ, (laughs) go to Netflix and watch it. And then you're going to want to show your friends. And then you're going to go, I wonder if my brother would sit through this, because that's what you're going to think. And that's how the Lord used Lee's book, 14 million copies later. What what right. are some things you've heard? Have you go ahead and say what, what's some of the feedback you've gotten from? Oh from gosh, this? Uh, anecdotally, I mean beyond just the idea of it being you know broadcast everywhere, and I and we know you know Lee uh, obviously Lee has more of a sense than, of this than I do, but you know he you know he he knows that when he goes and speaks in front of 10,000 people, that he's not going to be able to meet every one of those people, but he knows that he's planting seeds that may lead to something much deeper. And I, that's what I pray for, you know, for this film. The fact that it's being broadcast in a lot of countries right now, to me, you know, obviously I, I'm, I'm excited someday when I get to go meet my maker, (laughs) Mm. Uh, I'm not excited to go, have to go through what it takes to go meet my maker at this point. I, I, I have a lot of things that I still want to do, but I'm excited for someday being able to, you know, meet and greet, you know, all the people uh, who mm. may have have found eternity because of maybe mm. some words that I had written mm. over the years. And that that's a powerful experience. But anecdotally, we've heard, you know, many dozens of of testimonies and stories just through social media and uh you know youth pastors taking their kids their 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 young people from their church to see the film and having multiple experiences with young people wanting wanting to pray to receive Jesus at the end of the movie you know that when i hear things like that it's just like well you know, all the hard work, uh, you know, I do it in a heartbeat again, any day, any time, uh, over and over again, in order yeah. to know that there's that sort of fruit mm. being, being create, you know, being harvested. So mm. anyway, I, I just honestly, it's just, you know, I have a lot more I want to do, but I also could say, you know, I'm, I'm the happy camper having been able to be part of this, 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 mm. this film and, and it turned out so beautifully mm. that, you know, not because of me, but because of a lot of really great artists who participated. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure and an honor to, to be, to be part of that train. This is why we talk about no shame at the intersection of faith and culture. And I don't know any project or anybody that we've interviewed on these uh, podcasts that has done a project that more perfectly exemplifies that. Here is a story that is unashamed in its pursuit and its re- revelation of the gospel. Here is a, a writer who is not ashamed to be pigeonholed or ridiculed and takes it on and puts it in the highest artistic form. And here is the form of media that translates all over the world. It's been a tremendous honor to talk with you today, Brian. I pray and hope maybe I get a chance to work with you at some point in my career because uh, I really admire yeah. you and what you do. Thank you for your work on this. And please, everybody, if you've been listening to this podcast, 
this is what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to watch this movie. He wants you to spend the time <laughs> to watch the movie and take it to heart because it's got something for you. Um, thank you for joining us today, Brian. It's been a tremendous honor. Thank you, John. What a pleasure. Have no shame. Afraid.